So there's one final topic that we have to talk about uh, for the carbonyl section, and, and that has to do with the derivative that we briefly mentioned early on, uh, which is the enamine. So if you remember, if we have a carbonyl that has alpha protons and we condense it with a secondary amine, okay, so something that's not going to be able to be deprotonated at the imine stage or the amino ion stage to go to an imine, um, we're going to instead alpha deprotonate and get to this type of functionality, which is called an enamine or an, an amino substituted alkene. Okay, so this is this. We didn't talk about the chemistry that enamines can undergo, but now is the appropriate time to to mention this. So, what type of reactivity do we expect from enamines? Well, as usual, we can get a good sense if we think about the uh, relevant resonance form of an enamine. So here we have, let's just take a, just a very generic enamine here. Okay, so remember, we've got a lone pair on the nitrogen. And if we think about what resonance form we could draw for this, we would probably think about putting that, that lone pair, pushing that down and pushing this lone pair, uh, th sorry, these electrons over onto that alpha position. So that's gonna give us, uh, you know, electron density at that alpha carbon in this type of resonance form. So it turns out then that of course, based on this resonance form, you would expect that enamines are nucleophilic. So they would be expected to react with electrophiles. And in fact, that is exactly how enamines uh, react. They react as, uh, as nucleophiles, okay? And this is analogous to uh, thinking about the reactivity of an enolate, okay? So of course we thought about enolates and their relevant tautomers as being having a electron density at that alpha carbon, right? So anionic um, enolates react as if they are anionic at the carbon, and enamines are just sort of a neutral version of an enolate then, right? They just involve nitrogen instead of oxygen, and they're neutral instead of being negatively charged, but the reactivity pattern is the same. They're going to act like a enolate surrogate, okay? Well, this actually has a very special history, uh, not only for organic chemistry, but also for uh, the Columbia Chemistry Department because Gilbert Stork, um, uh, who, who is a very incredibly famous uh, chemist in our department, um, came up with something that's uh, now referred to as the Stork enamine synthesis. Um, and he came up with this in the 50s, uh, and so it's very classic chemistry, but uh, very, very useful and important chemistry. And so what Gilbert uh, basically developed was um, the, the strategy where you take a ketone uh, and you condense it with an amine. So I'll just show cyclohexanone and pyrrolidine. Um, and so they, we're just going to allow these to condense and that's going to form the enamine of the cyclohexanone. Okay. And what's useful here is that uh, this can be done quantitatively so we can force this all the way, and then we can actually isolate and purify the enamine if we want to. Um, we could do it in situ too, but, but it can be isolated. Um, and so in contrast to enols and enolates, which neither of those can be isolated, um, they're reactive intermediates. Enamines are actually neutral, and so they can be um, prepared and, and then used subsequently. But since, since these are now nucleophilic, um, you can react these uh, enamines with a variety of electrophiles. So for example, we could do a Michael reaction. So if we treat it with an alpha beta unsaturated um, ketone, for example, um, this is now nucleophilic and we can do that, that sort of conjugate addition, which in this case would give rise to the following intermediate. Okay, uh, and you know, so you know, there's probably going to not be minus charge and positive charge at the same time. So there's going to be a proton uh, involved, probably uh, uh, protonating this oxygen. But um, conceptually, we can just think about it this way. So notice what we did when we took an enamine and we used it as a nucleophile. We're then generating an aminium ion. You see how that works? We're generating an aminium ion. Just like when we have an enolate and we use it as a nucleophile, we generate a carbonyl. It's exactly analogous, okay? 
uh, except in this case we're going from neutral to positively charged. Um, and then all that's going to happen, so on, on this side, um, we're just going to protonate uh, this, this enolate to just get the neutral carbonyl out. Um, and then in terms of the aminium ion, what's going to happen here uh, usually is that this is actually going to reform the enamine, on, but on the other side. So it's not going to want to reform on the side that now has a substituent. That, that would sterically be... Um, very demanding, uh, very unfavorable. So it's usually going to form on the other side. So the immediate product of this Michael addition then looks like this. Okay. So we've free formed our enamine and we've added that substituent. Um, and then typically what one is going to do is to uh, do, do a reaction that's going to hydrolyze that enamine off. So we're just going to do the, the reverse uh, mechanism for enamine formation. That's going to uh, return our ketone. And when we do that, like we get the product that looks like um, we had added the cyclohexanone enolate into the methyl vinyl ketone. Um, it's just that in this case, we didn't have to go through an anion. Um, and so this, this was useful historically before um, working out how to form enolates um, selectively um, was well developed, uh, but it also can have um, utility uh, for uh, molecules that can't handle strongly basic conditions. So this is chemistry that works under neutral or, or possibly even slightly acidic conditions. So it has a, a, a you know a chemo orthogonality uh, to to LDA, for example. Right. So this is this is very good. Um, and as I said, developed by Gilbert Stork um, in 1954. So this is a uh, um, you know, sort of near and dear to the Columbia Chemistry Department. Okay, so there's a variety of things that one can do with enamines and, and with this historic uh, enamine synthesis. Um, and I'll just mention uh, two, two additional ones. Um, right, so we can also do alkylations. So if we were to say throw methyl iodide um, at, at an enamine, now we're going to have to heat this up. This is not, an enamine is more nucleophilic than an enol but it is nowhere near as nucleophilic as an enolate, right? And it's just the difference between a neutral and an anionic compound. The neutral just isn't as nucleophilic. So you do have to apply a bit more energy to get this to go, um, but you can get that to go. And in this case, you are going to then alkylate um, and then, you know, uh, more than likely, it depends on the conditions, but you might reform the enamine um, on the other side. Um, it really has to do with the acidity, but but that's okay. Uh, it's just a detail. When we hydrolyze this, um, then we are going to get our our carbonyl back. And you see what happens here is that um, we we were able to do uh, an alkylation um, as if it had come from uh, the the uh, cyclohexanone, um, as if we had cyclohexanone enolate, but we didn't have to use any strong base. Um, and the other thing that you can do here, um, you can actually react this with um, an acid chloride. So let's say you threw in uh, benzoyl chloride, and then uh, that's going to that's going to acylate that position as you would expect, and then you can throw in uh, your acidic water, and then the product of this process is going to look exactly like uh, a Claisen condensation. Okay, so uh, in this case, you you get this uh, uh, one three diketone, uh, and again, a selectivity here that. Um, you can preform an enolate, uh, sorry, an enamine of one component, and then add in um, your other component, which in this case, you know, really does have to be an acid chloride. Um, you're not going to have enough nucleophilicity to add to an ester, um, but uh, but but you can do this, and this is a, a good reaction. Um, and then the final thing I'd, I'd like to say about enamines is that um, you this basically gives you a strategy that you can use aldehydes as enolates. Right? We talked before about uh, forming enolates of aldehydes is complicated. LDA doesn't work. Um, and even if you do get to an aldehyde enolate, there's usually problems with uh, uh, overreaction and polymerization and things like that. So it, it doesn't tend to be um, a great reaction uh, when you're using um, you know, the, the direct enolate of an aldehyde. But uh, if you instead rely on enamine chemistry, uh, this can actually work out a lot better. So 
if I just say have an aldehyde like this and I condense it to form an enamine, then I can get to this, this enamine. And, and now this is actually going to be a better behavior. It's gonna allow me to do um, chemistry that I, that I wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. So for example, I could think about now alkylating um, the, um, the, the, this enamine which in this case then gives me this this product this aminium ion product um, and then and then if i hydrolyze this um, aminium ion that's going to give me this alkylation product so um, you, it just wouldn't work to analyze an aldehyde and then try to alkylate uh, that it's just not going to be a stable or, or viable uh, pathway but by taking an aldehyde and going to the enamine you can now think about doing those types of chemistry so uh, another another utility of enamines Okay, so that pretty much ends our discussion of carbonyl chemistry. We've really been through a lot. Uh, we've talked about uh, aldehydes and ketones and carboxylic acid derivatives. We've talked about condensation reactions um, uh, where we're bringing uh, carbonyls together. And now we've just finished off with uh, uh, actually getting nitrogen into the mix uh, where we're either doing Mannish reactions um, or we're using enamines as nucleophiles. So. There's a lot of chemistry here, but it's a very rich um, and, and exceedingly important aspect of organic chemistry and for the chemistry of life for that matter.